Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce Scott Mitchell of TSN. Thank you so much, Scott, for, for taking the time and doing this. It's not as though the Jays are in a, a playoff race, so uh, I know that you're busy, and I really appreciate you taking the time and doing this. Yeah, no problem. It's funny, baseball never ends, so there's really never a slow time. Maybe January, but uh, the last couple of years, we've seen you know George Springer and all these guys sign in January, so... Was it? Yeah, playoff race, spring training. It's it's always busy with the team that plays every damn day. Wasn't Springer like right before Christmas? I forget. I feel it was like right in December or something. It was like no, a... unfortunately. So Ryu was right in December, right before Christmas, and then they did the press conference on like December twenty seventh. But Springer oh. was right in the deep dark days of the pandemic. I think I want to say like January sixteenth. Or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that one well, just because it broke at about 11 p.m. And uh, <laughs> luckily, I had uh, just cracked a bottle of wine and it was about this much gone. And I was like, well, I'm working now. So it was, uh, yeah, definitely <laughs> January of 2020 or when, 2021. So my bad. Sorry. What do, you, what do you think is like the hardest part about being a, a baseball writer? Because as you said, it is such a like 365. Is it just like always caffeinated is that the key to success <laughs> what, what do you do um the hardest part um I, I would say the hardest part just because they play every day is the story is always changing um you know it's you know the offense and I've seen it with this ball club this year you know the offense could be a story one week and it's you know two three days they don't score a run and then all of a sudden they score 14 or 15 and, and you're saying okay so if you, it's it's hard to find narratives in terms of, um, you know, where hockey team would play twice a week and then the next team they play the next week, they play three games, you know, a five game set over two weeks. You can kind of talk about kind of the same things. But baseball, it's it's an ever changing narrative on of the, over the course of two, three days and it cycles and there's always a roster move. It's just um you know, the, the grind of it and the the story tone is much different. I mean, I covered the, the Calgary Flames a little bit earlier in my career. I did a lot of um, CFL stuff and baseball is just different, the coverage tone. You know, you, you kind of find, find a number and find a theme with a player and then go talk to them about that. It's just it's just totally different. And, you know, sometimes the stories, um, you know, pop up in May and then go away for you know two three months and then at the end of august you're kind of going back to the to the kind kind of the same story you covered in may so um yeah just it, it's hard to explain to anybody because even when i was not in baseball i looked at baseball and i said man that looks like a really tough sport to cover just because of um you know the daily nature of it and yeah it just really changes things when you show up at the park and you have one idea of a story and then, you know, oh, why is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. stuck struggling? Four mm -hmm. hours later, he hits two home runs, and you're like, okay, well, there goes my, you know, <laughs> hard to write that one now. So it, it's just a little different like that. No, it was interesting. I was listening to your podcast, The Scott Mitchell Show. Everyone should check it out because you, you had – um, some really cool interviews. I really enjoyed uh, uh, Davis. Appreciate Schneider, the blog. I appreciate the who blog. Is, well, you know, I, I'm going to get more into the the podcast kind of realm, but just on that, you talked to Jeff Passan, obviously, and you you talked about how you had to wait for the story. And that was something you learned. Like, when did you feel with baseball that you maybe got the 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 knack of maybe not just writing a story in the seventh inning and and maybe waiting? And how much harder is that to? have a story where you have to wait till the outcome is over if it's 11-1 do you just say screw it I know the story like how does that all work for you Scott so that's an interesting question because the the answer 10 years ago would have been much different so um in my role I don't write game stories um mm -hmm. we don't do game stories at TSN um if you're out there writing game stories um to be honest you should probably find a different way to do it unless you're writing game stories in a bit of a different way. And, you know, that's not to say it's, you know, to denigrate anybody that does game stories, but when you look at coverage, I mean, MLB.com does game stories. Um, I'm sure, you know, the, you know, hardcore baseball people that are consuming that type of coverage um, read those, but um, so if you are writing game stories, yeah, I mean, 
baseball is tough and you have to be able to, to deviate. And, you know, the 11, one game, that's the writer's dream. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the writer's dream is the 11, one game that in the seventh inning is suddenly 11, six after a five spot. And then you're like, Oh God, no, this is bad. <laughs> um, so, so it's tough. You, you need to be able to really think on your feet, to be honest, nothing is like covering the CFL and trying to write the last three minutes of a game that can, you know, mm-hmm. volley either That's way. And you're like, I, I've, I've had, I'm decent at writing on deadline. I've seen people that really struggle with it, but I've had moments, you know, late in games where, so one of the first baseball, I'll give you a good one. The first baseball kind of game story thing that I ran into was game seven of the world series in 2016 yes. uh, Cubs, Cubs, I'll call them the Indians, Cubs, Cleveland, whatever. Um, man, uh, I wasn't used to baseball. Um, I was sitting beside passing. That was the yep. story that I told on the podcast, actually. Yep. And that crazy game, um, I had two game stories. Literally, the, that was one of the only times, and I think you hear about these stories from, from. I mean, I was going to say older writers. I'm an older writer to a lot of people now, which is, I don't know about that. Life but... goes. Um, yeah. But uh, I had two, two game stories up. And I was just writing Cubs break, you know, whatever, 108-year drought. Indians break 67 year old, year old drought or whatever it was. And I just, I, I couldn't do it because I didn't know how it was going to go. And the game was so late that I had to click file right away. And uh, you know, it worked out. I don't know what showed up in, in the post media papers the next day. Um, that's what some people will tell you. Don't, uh, don't read the, uh, the first edition, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, 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 it can be tough. And, and baseball, as we know, like any, no lead is safe really in the eighth or ninth inning, unless you've got like a 10 run lead normally. So it's tough um, and it's a skill and it's, you know, just dealing with, you know, the, the pressure of knowing and writing clean and just being able to, to kind of think on your feet and being prepared, just knowing that, you know, you can't sit back and be like, ah, oh, this is good. This is yeah. good in a three run game. So it's 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 interesting but i mean my whole overarching um kind of uh outlook on that would be don't write game stories write a uh, interesting feature before the game find a way to weave in something about the game there there's so many different ways and you know if you're writing for a newspaper or or a, whatever it is i don't think anyone wants to read a play by play of yeah. you know um this double play in the third inning um tell stories about people and then weave in things about the game. That's kind of always been my philosophy. And and, and with that, like, how do you, cause now you do like, you also do prospects. And I just wanted to touch upon that. Like how do, is that process process or prospects? Pardon me. Um, for when you kind of scout and you have your top 50 blue Jays ranking, like uh, prospects, like how does that come together? Is that a 365 thing? Are you watching clips of, people in Dunedin and like just tell us a little bit about that yeah um it's become a 365 thing um to be honest uh you know as I've always been into prospects first of all I think I told this story on maybe one of my podcasts um yeah I I got into them I've I've always played fantasy baseball um Mm -hmm. since I was legitimately so I was telling this story the other day to my producer my first fantasy baseball league I, I can vividly remember drafting Todd Helton as a rookie oh yeah <laughs> yeah so like I mid 90s I, I didn't even look up what year but like 95 97 like the internet was it was brand new it was brand yeah. new um so I've always been into you know prospects in any sport um really um I've always just liked following that kind of aspect of it so I've done I used to do hockey prospects back in the day and, and baseball. So as of kind of the, the top 50 at TSN has kind of evolved, it's turned into, yeah, just it's easier for me to kind of make calls and, and um, you know, keep tabs on guys uh, as the season goes on rather than the first couple of years when I would just like the season would end and in November, I would just immerse myself and, you know, play mm-hmm. catch up. So the process has evolved a little bit to be long winded about that. But um what was your original question? Yeah, just like how does it all come about? But I guess I want to also ask is just like how do you manage those relationships with players and, and coaches? Like you you've had 
a bunch of players on the team. You had Ross Atkins on your show, David Schneider. Uh, you had uh, John Schneider. There's so many Schneiders. Um, but just how do you develop those relationships with players, but at the same time kind of write and talk honestly and critically uh, about them as well? Uh, I mean, good question. It's, uh, you know, first of all, I would say just be yourself. Like, that's what I do. Um, you know, some people like it, some people don't. That's <laughs> that's life. But, um, you know, just being honest, being yourself. I, I, I tell people a lot, like, you know, I have a lot of good relationships. And, you know, I tell them, like, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll probably talk shit about you at some point. So just, <laughs> you know, let, let's let's be clear that, you know, just because we we're friendly and stuff doesn't mean I'm I'm, I'm going to pull punches. And, mm. you know, I, I think one one of the phrases I've used over my career is, um, you know, I, I really like being right more than I like being biased. So mm. I like I'm not going to I'm not going to say something that, you know, I is just biased that I know is going to show up being wrong. Why? Why would I do that? You know, if you're a journalist, I don't understand why you'd want to make yourself look like that just to either protect somebody or be stubborn or be biased for no reason. So, um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it, you know, you, the, the right word you use was managing. It's you, you manage relationships like you manage, you know, your one with your girlfriend. It's, you know, there's there's days where they're like, holy shit, why would you say that on Twitter? And, you know, the next day it's, hey, man, how you doing? And hopefully you, you meet people like that and develop sources like that, that, uh, you know, are understanding of your side of the job. And I, I think, you know, people that, you know, haven't developed sources, you start to realize you develop sources that are similar to you, you know, hmm. and you get along. That's the reason you get along. And that's the reason you trust each other. And, you know, as long as that trust is, you know, 100%, um, you know, felt on their part, it, it becomes fairly easy. But, um, you know, be yourself. And just, you know, if you've got some people skills, and, you know, you got the ability to, to sidle up to a scout, you know, and just kind of talk to them, like, you know, you, you know, them a little bit, rather than, you know, kind of be, you know, timid and things like that. It, 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 it helps like that. But, you know, don't be scared of people and just be yourself, really. And to go back to your last question that I remember, you were talking about, um, you know, scouting and how that kind of works and what I'm doing. Um, first of all, I hate the word scouting. I write this okay. in my I write this in my prospects piece. I'm not a scout. So okay. all of I, I have observations on players and I will look and I like certain things um, more in the stat lines than, you know, visual eye test. I don't go out there and say, oh, that's a 70 grade arm. And I don't yeah. really like journalists that kind of you know push themselves into scouting I'm very open you know all of my stuff comes from the people I talk to because I'm a journalist so everything I'm writing in those blurbs is backed up by something that somebody's told me and not just me thinking I'm out there you know all of a sudden being an MLB scout I'm not um you know can I pick out certain things do I have certain opinions absolutely um but I rely on the experts and the people that are giving me the information. Um, same thing if I tweet something. If I tweet an opinion on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it, um, it's usually backed up by something. I'm okay. not saying per sources, <laughs> but all of my opinions are usually based well, on talking crazy. to somebody smarter than me. Yeah, no, I get that. So I know this is your eighth year covering the Jays. Uh, what do you make of this season? Because it feels as though it's like the most uninspiring, decent team uh, like that's maybe going to make the playoffs. Like what what do you make of this season? Maybe what are some of the storylines that you've kind of noticed? And, and maybe how likely do you feel this team will finally kind of get over the line and maybe make the playoffs and maybe win a game? That would be nice, too. Are you, are you a Jays fan? Like, did you yeah. grow up a Jays fan? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I remember 15, 16 very well. I remember that the drought, I remember hearing Bautista's hit on a uh, bat flip on, on the radio, actually. I was going to a, a, a basketball game, weirdly enough. The, the Raptors were in Ottawa for whatever reason. So I remember driving in traffic and hearing it. Oh, wow. interesting. Then everyone there was watching the game. So yeah, that, that's my bat flip moment. It's not as inspiring or interesting as other people but uh i didn't throw a beer on the field either so i guess i guess uh i did it the right way i don't have one at all i was in i was in calgary that was the the, the season before i arrived before. actually i do have one because the reason i got i got the job is um 
I was, uh, I don't know if I've ever told the story before. Mm. Um, I was actually in Toronto for a road trip uh, for the Argos and Stampeders in October of 2015. And I was meeting the boss of of Post Media, um, who is a really big supporter of mine. And uh, we're sitting there and we're at, uh, I wish I could remember the bar, King Street East, right across from the old Toronto Sun building. And mm, I'm kind of like looking over his shoulder and I'm, I I can't keep my eyes off the game. Like I grew up playing baseball and um, just cool. because of the lack of teams and jobs, I never really aspired to cover baseball because I at least was trying to be realistic and say like, <laughs> well, there's a lot of hockey teams. I'll probably end up covering that. So anyways, long story short, he kind of like, are you a baseball guy? And I'm like, oh yeah, I played, you know, triple A oshawa growing up uh, a couple of guys on my team were drafted love baseball cool. um and he's like oh interesting he's like would you ever cover it and i'm like ah, i don't know it looks like a real grind i'm like i'm not sure i want that and then um about eight months later bob elliott retired um yeah. from the toronto sun and i kind of started to put two and two together and i quickly got a phone call and you know do you want to interview for this and i said sure and Came back, moved back oh. for, for them for about three months and then moved to TSN. So that's okay. how I got here. And that's, you know, that's, you know, why it's tough to plan this career out. If you're a younger journalist, I would just say be open, be open to opportunity, mm-hmm. especially now. Like I, I came into this 20 years ago when there was even, you know, there was more jobs than there are now. Just be open, you know especially people that have different sporting interests. Like, you know, yeah. if you like basketball, hockey, football, baseball, learn them all, learn them all because I've covered all of them. And if I would have said that I would have covered, you know, football and, and baseball 20 years ago, I'd probably been like, well, where, like, how would that opportunity come <laughs> up? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Oh, cool. No, that's interesting. I definitely understand the being a sports fan, and, and did and, you have a question there again? Did I'm yeah, not yeah, no, it's okay. Questions. No, no, no. What I was, was asking about the Jays, but we we went on. <laughs> time. But that's that's. I'm fun. like, let's talk about me some more. Let's, yeah, no, uh, yeah. no, that was really interesting. Um, normally, I all guess, right, let's talk. Let's talk about the Jays. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. Uh, now I remember your question. Sorry, I just okay, really no, like no, don't to apologize. Me. I should show my girlfriend that she's gonna be like, yeah, let's of course. Um, okay. I'm the same way. Don't 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 <laughs> apologize. <laughs> So, yeah, no, I mean, this has been a weird year, but what I would say is like the the thing that I've noticed and even in that question there, it's all based on expectations Mm. because I've watched over the last eight years, I've watched many worse teams than this, like many, many worse Blue Jays teams than this. But when people get the expectations and here's what I'm going to say, and people that are going to listen to this are going to be like, like, what's wrong with this guy? Um, I don't understand why people are f- so frustrated with this team, to be honest. I-, I get, you know, baseball is a daily, like I said, it's a daily wave. So if, if and some people, and I was just on uh, 1050 with my guys, mm-hmm. Koronik and Koliakbo. Yeah. And Carlo Koliakbo, I kill him on this. He rides the w- a wave of every game, like it's the NFL season. And I'm like, man. I'm like, aren't you like, you must be stressing yourself out because it's just, you're going to do that all year because it's baseball. There's going to be five game losing streaks. There's going to be six game winning streaks. You know, you're going to go, you're going to lose, win, lose. And it's just going to, that's how it goes. It's baseball. And it goes like that for every team in the league. And I think what people lose is the context of how up and down just the season is for every single baseball team. And here's my question to, to Blue Jays fans. When you watch this team, I get it. You know, the offense frustrating. The pitching, though, has been the most consistent pitching staff that I've seen um, in my time covering this team, except for 2016. So they used seven total starters this year. In 2016, they used six. And that's just amazing. So, like, you haven't had pitching frustration. So what do people want? They want when the expectation is they're going to win the division – I guess people just want them cruising to the division title with 101 wins right now, which is not really an expectation you should ever have in baseball. So I kind of get people's frustration. I figured it out, but man, being in a playoff race, they've got like the fifth best record in all of baseball right now. You know, this team has put themselves in the exact position they need to put themselves into. And I guess it's just been a little 
bit topsy turvy for people. And I guess people really like home runs and the offense has been yeah. down this year. Was... So look, I, I think the offensive drop off has been a little bit, you know, stunning. You know, I can go through a list and you know, if you want a, a question of why the Blue Jays are sitting at what is it right now? I don't know, mid eighty five and sixty eight. I wanna I think I got that right, but I could there be you wrong. Go. something like that. Sorry. Um if you want to, if you want the one reason, um, you know, it's look at the lineup. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. not meeting expectations. George Springer not meeting expectations. Alejandro Kirk not meeting expectations. Matt Chapman, other than his first month, not meeting expectations. So you can look at this team and say, oh man, like, and, and I see this on Twitter all the time. Ross Atkins needs to be fired. And it's, it's like, well, I mean, he put together a really good team. There's literally like four of your best players just not performing. So to me, I, I put this, this you know, if this season ends before people want it to, you put it on the players. I mean, the roster construction, you have a hard time arguing with. Um, you know, it's it's three guys that were in the All-Star game, four if you want to include Santiago Espinal that just haven't met expectations. And, you know, if those guys are out hitting like they're capable of, this, game, this team is, what, three, four wins better, five wins better? Mm-hmm. They're probably yeah. right there at about 90 wins in the race for the division right now. And that's not even without mentioning that your opening day starter has done nothing. So Yeah, I know you wrote about that, that situation. Can I just get you a little bit on, like, what happened with Manoa? Because I think it's a quite fascinating. Sure, man. What, what do you know about the situation? I know you wrote about it, but any updates? Because it feels as though there's an update every, like, five days on, on that thing. Yeah, um, I would say, yeah, I wrote the column before um, kind of the last update. The last update I did was strictly on Sports Center. So, yeah, I mean, odd situation. And, um you know, it's one of those ones that has a lot to do with um, expectations and, and the business of baseball. Obviously, when he was demoted the first time, there was a little bit of talk just surrounding how long he would go down from his camp um, and the Blue Jays. And that's all around service time. Um, it's mm-hmm. all the fact he came up early. He was scheduled to be super two, which would have got him an extra trip through free agency, which, you know, if he pitches well is at least a, a couple million bucks in, in his pocket. So obviously that was a little bit of a um, a conversation. And then when you see how quickly he came back up, and I think everyone thought it was a, a little bit early, um, that was part of it. So then when they tried to demote him in, in August, uh, his camp essentially, you know, kind of wanted him to go on the major league IL, which obviously collects service time. So, yeah. you know, the, the optics of it are, are very simple really. And, um, you know, then he, he started complaining about some soreness in different areas from, you know, depending on who you talk to and, you know, you add it all up and, and, and you kind of wonder, and look, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and accuse Alcman of faking injuries. Um, and I think that's why you, you see the blue Jays also treading very carefully around the topic. Uh, you know, long story short, the the relationship's very fractured right now, and you know, it's it's disappointment on Manoa's part that he's not living up to expectations. It's it's you know him trying to find a reason, and and nobody's really found a reason t- as to why he struggled. It's just the stuff was diminished, and you know, if he is hurt, um, you know, that will kind of tell a lot of the story. But the Blue Jays have, have checked him out, and they can't find anything at this point. Um, so he's gone through some stuff on his own and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where this story goes, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, essentially was a, a little bit of a fight. He didn't, uh, report to AAA right away and, you know, hasn't pitched, hasn't been on a mound and, and we'll see where this goes, but, uh, hmm. yeah. yeah, it's gonna one, be... one of the, one of the odder, odder stories that, that I've covered in terms of, uh, you know, a guy ascending like this and then you know the story going going like that and I really like Alec Alec uh, to me has always been a good dude so I will say um you know I've heard he's getting some bad advice and I'm not saying from his agent but from some from some people around him in terms of what to do right now and you know if that's the case and you know he's not on a mound for that reason um you know that, that that's pretty disappointing and I hope he gets his career back on track I will say right now I don't know that it's going to be in Toronto Mm, that's interesting great tidbit uh I want to ask about the rest of the pitching staff and and maybe specifically uh let's say they play the Rays or the the Twins in the first uh in the uh, wild card 
series. It's still weird for me to call it a series. Um, just who's your like who's the three starting pitchers that you roll out because this pitching staff has been so good all year, as you mentioned, only seven. They're they're second in ERA a lot due to the fact of their they're starting pitching. So who's your your top three? And I, I'd imagine Kevin Gosman's one of them uh as well. Yeah, yeah. Um Gosman starting game one. Um and then um it, it's pretty easy to me to be honest. And then and then mm-hmm. I'm going Barrios Bassett, but flip flop those based on the matchups, you know, um based on the ballparks. Um yeah, okay. that, that's pretty no, easy no, for me. I'm not. I'm not giving you. Say, I'm not giving you say Kikuchi a, a start. No thanks. I'll. <laughs> I'll. I'll take. I'll take my. You know, consistent right-handers, and you know, Kikuchi could go seven strong, or you could be digging into the bullpen in the second inning, and I'm. I'm not into that. So I, I think you know when you look at Bassett's track record, um, you know, I'd be pretty pretty comfortable throwing him out there. You know, hoping for a quality start. Um, and and same with rios the way he's pitched this year so those guys both have pitched in big games and you know have a a, a level headedness to them that i i think i would you know make that that conversation pretty easy and then you you stick kikuchi in the pen and if you need him for three three four long innings um you know hopefully you don't because probably the game is not in your favor if you need uh need kikuchi but i, I think he plays a little bit of a different role back there well, what do you make of Vladdy's kind of underperformance this year? And now he's like a bit injured. Like, do you think that's maybe a reason why? Because I know going into camp or into the season, he had a knee problem and it seems to be recurring. Just yep. is, do you think that's like how much maybe of that is maybe because of his lack of success attributed to that? And just what do you make about him this year and maybe his future with the Blue Jays? Yeah, I've said this more than anybody in the beat. I think I think he's hurt. Um, you know, I think he's and sorry, I don't think he's hurt. I think he's yes, I think he's hurt. I'm like dealing with an injury, to, maybe. Yeah. I'm trying to deal with the injured and hurt. Um, yeah. you know, I've talked to a lot of people in his camp. The the wrist injury, if you look at it from May 5th, um, the power numbers are are super down from the day he had that MRI quietly. So, you know. Under 300, under 400. It was amazing to you know, start the year too, eh? Like he was. That's great. the thing. So you know, it's it's pretty easy to to look at, and you know, wrist injuries, sap power. Um, you know, knee injuries are are really tough for for hitters to grind through. So, yeah, I mean, obviously very concerning right now, and and long term that that kind of keeps cropping up a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I I think he's he's been grinding through things more than people know, and I, I think you know maybe October November we get some real information on that. Um, you know I know quietly he's every time I see him in the clubhouse sometimes he's got a wrist pack on his on his uh, or a wrist pack an ice pack on his yeah. wrist. Um, you know kind of managing the knee stuff. So it, it's been an odd year, and again because the expectations are so high with this guy. Um, you know, anything less than an MVP type season is always going to be a disappointment, which is, you know, tough to live up to. And I, I think, you know, fundamentally, when you look at his swing and you look at what he's been doing in the box, uh, way more chase than you've ever seen. And really, it's not, you know, everyone's mechanics get out of whack over the course of 162 at some mm-hmm. point. Um, but I, I think when you look at him, it, it's been approach. And anyone I talk to, the amount vladdy cares the amount this guy like loves to play the game um you know i know some people will kill him for not running out a a a single or a a ground ball at some points but this guy loves the game he doesn't pull himself over the lineup i've I've talked to people that yeah maybe he should have sat for for you know a stretch with the wrist thing in may um it sounds so cliche but saying he's trying to do too much is, is really kind of what he's faced at times. Cause you see him, you know, r- with runners on, you know, chasing too much. He, he really has thought about that MVP type season in, in 2021 mm-hmm. and being like that, that's my standard. That's his personal standard too. So when he's not meeting that, he def you can definitely see him start to press and chase. And it, it's, it's so cliche just pressing is like, what does that mean for a hitter? No. But when you see him, you know, swinging through high fastballs, chasing sliders, um, it's him just trying to do too much. And I've talked to so many people and it just sounds like such an easy explanation. Um, but that's really it. It's that. And I think he's been grinding through injuries more than people know. Um, 
before I want to ask you just what you see about this team going into the hopefully the playoffs. But if if the Jays, you know, whimper out, hopefully not like they did last year because that was traumatic. Um or missed the playoffs. How likely do you think Atkins and Inchapar are back with this team? Good question. Um, I think they're back just because of kind of what I said before, where I don't think you can blame the construction of this team. Um, I think you blame, you know, the the performance of, of some of the players. And, you know, what are you going to do when George Springer is having his worst MV or worst season of his career offensively in June, you can't, it's not fantasy baseball. You can't just trade him, um, yeah. you know, get something, get something else. So um, I, I think they're back. Um, you never really know when it's been this long and they spent into the luxury tax and, you know, expectations are so high. You never know when ownership's just going to say, you know what, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And you're probably kind of reaching that point you know, next year, if they, if they miss the playoffs, I think if they miss the playoffs, it's, it's a, it's a conversation. It's yeah. Um, I, I know from ownership and, and it's very unique covering this team because we don't hear from ownership. You know, we yeah. don't see Edward Rogers, you know, there's no owner that I see, you know, walking around the ballpark like you do in, in other cities that you can be like, Hey, you know, what do you, you know, vote you of confidence think? for the, for the president and, you know, GM and that just doesn't happen. So it, it's really hard to gauge how ownership feels about this team. You know, you do hear things and, you know, I know expectations were super high this year because they spent into the luxury tax. And here's another little tidbit for you of heading into the soft season and what to look for. There's, there's big tax implications. If you go over the luxury tax twice, mm -hmm. will, will ownership do, do that? that. Um, or do you let Matt Chapman walk, you know, decline Whit Merrifield's $18 million option? How much do they spend after that? This team could really pull back this year, um, mm. which will be obviously the fans will not be happy with that. They're not going to be happy with, oh, you know, Arelvis and Addison Barger are going to be our third baseman and we'll figure it out in spring training. Yeah. You know, some prospect people will be. Um, the general fan base will be like, well, you know, what are we doing? Um, yeah. So so it, it, it's really interesting to look at that. I, you know, I, I think they've done a good job, in my opinion, um, a good enough job not to be fired. I think this this team is, is still kind of trending in the right direction. And, you know, that's kind of my argument when, you know, anyone kind of criticizes this front office is 2019, they lost 95 games. 2020, they're better. 2021, they missed. 2022, they make it. You know, I would expect them to make the playoffs this year with kind of the same amount of wins. Um, yeah, so who are you going to find that's, you know, going to take them to the next step? I, I think Schneider will be a question, even though he's got two years left on his deal. Is that the move? Mm -hmm. um, they didn't win the World Series. I think something will have to change. Um, coaching staff, you know, I, I would be very surprised if, if Atkins and Shapiro aren't back. And I think the only way they aren't is it'll take some sort of real, real disappointment in the in the in the ownership ranks and saying like, look, we spend in the luxury tax, we don't want a World Series. I think that would be fairly reactionary, though. How likely do you think this team, if they are like, I know baseball and the playoffs are just a different thing, and it's such a small sample size. But how likely, or or maybe what are like, what what do you think they like? Do you think this team could do a lot of damage in the playoffs? Absolutely. I, I felt it last year too. Um, as you kind of you, you kind of looked at those first two games of the Yankee series, Bo starts swinging it. You know, if these guys get hot, like if George Springer and Bo and you know Vladdy get hot, you know this this team can make a run, and the pitching is good enough to make a run. Um, I felt the same way last year. You know, if that series doesn't go sideways, it's good enough to make a run. Um, yeah, I mean, you get in, anything can happen, and I think you know the best example. You know, Brandon Belt has multiple World Series that, you know, going into that playoffs, nobody expected mm -hmm. those teams to win. And and that's the thing. If Kevin Gosman, you know, pulls a Madison Bumgarner and is going eight innings and striking out 10, you know, and, and locking up wins like that. And it's all about this offense. If those guys get hot, like, you know, Bo Bichette, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And, and George Springer are, can be three of the best, you know, hitters in October if, they're going George, right. George Springer has a World Series MVP, so you know he he's been good in the playoffs. 
Well, that's the thing. And, and, you know, he's due, he's due to get hot for two, three weeks. And that's the thing you, you, you see players get hot for three weeks in June and nobody really pays attention. <laughs> you get hot at the right three weeks, you know, from September 25th to about October 20th, mm-hmm. you know, you can ride guys like that. And that's the thing it, it, we'll, we'll see. So they're, they're good enough. Um, it's just, you haven't seen that offense consistency all year. So it, it's hard to really kind of expect it. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Scott, for, for doing this. I know you're a busy man. Um, I just want to give you the floor. Uh, obviously, the Scott Mitchell so show. So busy, I haven't even shaved. <laughs> Me neither. So that that makes two of us. But <laughs> uh, just anything you're working on going forward at, at TSN, what people can maybe expect from you, and, and maybe you can feel free to plug anything you want, uh, including your podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. I appreciate the the podcast shout out. Uh, we kind of just got that going monthly this year. It's starting, it's going to be every two weeks, probably okay. kind of starting. We got another one coming out. We did a good one with, with Jordan Romano. Um, oh yeah. So yeah. I, I just needed to ease into it this year with, you know, all the other responsibilities. So, but, but it's been fun. The podcast. Yeah. You can check that out. Scotty Mitch show, uh, Twitter and, and Instagram. Yeah, right now, some some things to look forward to. One of the my funnest pieces every year is the top 50 free agents I do with Steve Phillips. Mm-hmm. That'll come out, you know, first week in November as soon as the uh, the season wraps up. And we're going to do a little fun thing this year with, um, you know, on the podcast kind of, you know, delving into that a little bit more awesome. than we we can in just, uh, in just writing. So um, there's that. And then, you know, you already plugged it. Then I go into... You know, Arizona Fall League this year, Ricky Tiedemann will be there. Um, so I'll be working on the the top 50 prospects and hopefully getting some vacation. So I had knee surgery last winter, so I, 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 didn't, how, get, how I didn't get much vacation time. Um, so, yeah. I was the knee holding? And then we'll see We'll see how long I'm working here. I, I you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, I, I think I think this team's good enough to – to you know at least mm. win around get into the ds maybe get to the alcs so you know i'm fully i'm not i'm put it this way i'm not booking any vacation until until uh at least mid-october so awesome well uh hopefully uh you know the jays make a long run for for you and then and, and obviously for me I'd, I'd love to see that uh it'd be pretty cool i still remember 15 and 16 very fondly so hopefully uh, jays fans uh, and i hope your knee is intact for the the champagne celebrations and and late october as well that's if, uh, hopefully it's intact after the champagne well, that too, that that too is the, as well. uh, that's actually uh, the only time my knee is great but like when i walk around crowds and like there's little kids around my knees i'm like don't fall into my knees so it's weird <laughs> you, you get and like it's amazing because i can't imagine athletes that you know have to like get all the way back to running and you know especially nfl players with you know people falling near your legs and oh. you've already gone through this man that's the yeah. mental side of, of injuries is, is unbelievably, real. and I can't even understand it to, you know, a level that they can, but it's crazy. Well, so I, I, I hope, appreciate you uh, asking them. I hope they win the World Series, and then I hope Shohei Atane comes home uh, to, to Toronto and maybe have a big uh, free agency piece. Uh, we'll see. I, that would, that'd be pretty cool, but uh, I feel like that's unlikely. But thanks again, Scott, for doing this. I really, really appreciate it, and uh, hopefully you uh, – you know, for everyone else, have a, a long, a short off season because the Jays have, have gone far. But thanks again, Scott. Thanks for wishing me to work longer this this year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's Appreciate it. Any anytime, man. Anytime.